name is Yvette, um, Yvette O, Chief Medical Officer, and good afternoon everybody and welcome to our weekly report out um, and I'm delighted to say we're at the LGI this week because um, quite often we've been doing this at St James's so it's really good to be, to be here. Um, we have got um, a really good agenda for you today and um, as you know Julian normally um, hosts these sessions, but he is here remotely. He's on FaceTime. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> behave yourself. Um, it's also International Nurses Day today. Um, and so Suzanne is out and about um, celebrating the um, celebrating with various groups of nurses. But we have Ross here from Communications, and he has asked if um, all the nurses in the audience might um, gather at the end of report out and have a photograph together. And um, hopefully we'll be tweeting as we um, as we go, Dean, the great tweeter. <laughs> and, um, and, and hopefully he will won't tweet. So, we have three um, teams reporting out today, um, and we will hear from them consecutively, and then we'll have opportunities <coughs> for questions. So, um, our first um, report out is coming from um, Will Clark, and Will is one of our core medical trainees in coming to the end of his second year so he'll soon be a specialty trainee I hope um, and um, Will and I first met on J07 when I was doing a walkabout and um, I'm not going to tell you any more because Will is going to tell his story but we might have a, a little discussion in the questions at the end so Will over to you Hello. Hi, I'm Will. Um, I'd like to talk to you about my waste reduction project uh, on looking at stock rooms. Um, something that affects pretty much everyone who works on the wards every day, but something that we've not done particularly well on, I, I don't feel. So I'm going to go through why I chose to do this, um, what the aim is, what I've actually done so far, and what I plan to do in the future, if, if I can, Let's see how it goes. So, why should we improve the stock rooms? I think, at, at the moment, our stock rooms, uh, I sort of see them as a grey wall. You go in, everything's there, but you can't quite work out where everything is straight away. Every single ward is a completely different structure, a completely different pattern. You have to learn everywhere you go. Considering you're covering six, seven wards as an on-call doctor, critical care outreach, an entire hospital, um, it's difficult. I think it's really important for patient safety you can get in and out of a stock room with all of your stuff for two Y4 cannulas for a bleeding patient in 30 seconds if they're set up right. Usually you're on two to three minutes looking around for kit and it's just, it's incredibly frustrating at times. It's a site of waste and I, I look mostly at time because it, it, you can cut a lot of time out that you spend in stock rooms by just thinking about it and being a bit more clever. Um, and staff morale, this is from one of the outreach sisters and I've stolen it, but it's brilliant. She spends all day cooking in other people's kitchens, she just cannot find anything. And you should never ever hear anyone describe a stock room as infuriating. And sometimes you do, it's just, you just can't find stuff. Um, this is a bit of an experiment, I learned about this two days ago. So this is a driver diagram, if it's completely wrong, I'm very sorry. Here's my aim, to create a recognisable, easy to use and efficient stock room to save time and reduce frustration. And there are three big parts of this. The main two, which are easy to do straight away, is improving our labelling and improving our organisation and standardisation. So I'll look at labels in a minute, but the organisation standardisation is uh, where Vet and introducing me to the uh, KPO team comes in with the 5S approach. And then I've got some ideas of how to put standards and orders into any stock room of any shape and any size and any order. It should be doable. And then changing world culture and stock room management is a really big one. We have no way to change them at the moment. We like to keep them as they are, but they do change all the time. People lose stuff at night and you lose all, all reference to where you were before. So they're the things we need to work on. 
So, what did I do? It's a little bit smaller than that. Um, I only looked at bloods and cannula equipment because it applies mostly to the doctors and it doesn't affect the nursing stock. Um, I reorganized and I relabeled uh, the stock rooms in the Glare Tower Wing related to medicine. Um, so the respiratory ones are below. Uh, I then looked at how much time you save collecting cannula equipment on all of those wards. And then I did a questionnaire before and after for the doctors who were working on there to see what they thought, how they thought it had gone. So, something missing there, but hopefully it'll here. Um, this is essentially, there it is. This is essentially <laughs> what I did. Um, so you can see we've gone from, this is a normal drawer, there is a label on there. You can't really see it, it's probably on the top there. There's another label, there's another. You can't really see them, so I replaced them with these big, bold, colourful labels. Letters to denote uses. Um, and if you look closely, there is a sort of CCC ABB pattern that runs all the way down. Then there's variation on either side, but the joy of this system when you've got colour is when you, when you can't put something next to all the other kit, all you do is take a step back, scan the room for red, and you know exactly where it is. You don't have to search up and down every stack. Um, and this is an example of my new labelling compared to the old one. So a few things have been done here. Okay, colour. Uh, I would say a slightly nicer font. I was <laughs> it You'll find that's NHS standard aerial in this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got rid of the price. And I don't, I, I don't know whether I'm allowed to or not. You can see I've left all the other labels up because I wasn't sure. Because I feel when you're looking at a label, you, you've got to have it so you can scan it. And that means when you see it, you see the word. And you see that word instantly, it processes through your brain and you know what it is. Lower font is absolutely essential. You cannot use uppercase. That's why no road signs are uppercase. You can't read them. And putting the price on the end extends the word out and makes it more complex and you can't instantly see what you're looking at. It takes longer to read. So we might try and look at reintroducing that, the prices at some point in the future, but it needs to be really careful because otherwise you you sort of damage your label as a, as a thing to read and that's its first role. And then pricing and stuff, but it, it's something to look at in the future. I've not done it in this stage. So here's my results page. It's a bit cluttered, I'm very sorry, and it's sort of cut off the bottom. Um, <coughs> Here's the time differences across. Uh, what I, I couldn't rearrange, so you get a time saving purely by relabeling. It doesn't look like masses, but if you're going in five, six times a day, and if you've got multiple members of staff, it makes a huge difference. This is the questionnaire. This is ease of use. I tried to get them to only talk about bloods and cannulas, but it's a bit difficult. So 4.4 .4 ease of use stock groups as they stand, uh, up to seven. I couldn't reorganize everything. I, it, will, it wasn't perfect, but it was better. Um, how well were items located from one another? 4.4 to 7.7. .7. So, again, an improvement, and people really noticed it. This is the interesting one. The labels made a really big difference. People did not like the way it's labeled currently, and which is a bit sad, because I understand from the stores people that I'm in close contact with, they've not even finished putting the new labels on the wards. They're still doing it. And I turn up and politely ask them to sort of consider doing it all over again, or at least letting me do it all over again, and they were you know, a little bit prickly about that. They've done a lot of work on it. Um, but you see it improves a lot. And this is, are you still frustrated with stock rooms? Um, which is, yes, people still are. So, what do I want to do next? So I've tested the idea of moving around one what, node of use, one set of uses, and relabeling it. What I want to do now is take a stock room, and I'm looking at Ward 7, where me and Yvette met, um, in Blairtown Wing, and taking the entire stock room to bits. Reassembling everything by how it's used, what it's used with, creating a standard that you can then move around and change. Color coding, relabeling, and, uh, and hopefully simplifying things down. Making it really accessible rather than labeling absolutely everything with everything that's in every drawer. So it's okay, but the stocks people know what's there. And if you've got a standard where it says needles, and then all the needles are in there in the same order in every wall, you don't need to label it five times. So looking at things like that, which is going to take a bit of time. And then moving on to the next stock group, refining what I've done, try and improve it, and then hopefully create a resource pack that people can start to use. This is all 
key in getting stores involved on this because this all, this entire project has a massive impact on them, a huge amount of workload, and I've not quite worked out how to reduce that for them yet. Um, but really, just bringing people into a stock room that's finished and saying, "Well, we can do this. I mean, we can do this in your ward." And every ward, you can walk in. And it won't look the same. If you find one item, you know where all the others are because they will be arranged in roughly the same order, color coded, and accessible. And that's that's essentially it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Will. And we did. We just met on J07, and um, I said to Will, "Oh, do you work on the ward?" And he said, "No, I've just come." to rearrange the stock room. <laughs> and um, I want to find the, um, the ward manager so I can discuss it with them. And then he told me a bit more about what he'd been doing in Gledhow Wing. And I said, oh, have you ever heard of 5S or Lean? He said, well, not, not in detail. And, uh, and so we introduced um, Will to the KPO team. And I think that the piece of work is brilliant and um, it, it, I think it has a lot more potential um, to, um, to really make the lives of our uh, staff a lot easier, particularly our staff who move from ward to ward, not just the junior doctors. Um, so, um, so thank you very much and, and we'll have some questions at the end I think Will, so if you're able so to... Make my thanks slide disappear but... Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 so you might or might not be here who uh, didn't wear labels for it's been absolutely ages. Thank you. <laughs> the label thing is really interesting yeah. about the font and... Um, it's it's stuff that you don't think about straight away, but then you, you start reading into it and it's like, oh, we could do better here. We could do, you could do so much more. That's, that's just my idea. It's way more. Brilliant. Right. Thank you very much. So... Um, our next team uh, is Matt and Rob and Andy. Hey. And they're going to tell us about their work to improve e referrals and e triage to develop e triage. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hello. My name is Ashley Craig. I'm the Assistant Director of Operations and Performance for the organisation. Hello, everybody. God, that's a bright one. So I'm to one side. Um, what, I just want to introduce this piece of work because it fell out of the outpatient program work that we're doing. It's not traditional needs improvement method, but it felt that we should share it at this point because we want to roll out some of the things that we've learned across the trust in the coming months. And um, basically, what it was about. There we go. Um, we had multiple routes into outpatients for referrals from GPs from other organisations. We had bits of paper, we had faxes, we had choosing book, we had. Um, a, a way of sending it a referral electronically, but it wasn't really a booked appointment. And we had loads and loads and loads of bits of paper across the organisation that went into envelopes on desks that got picked up, got moved around. And actually, that's the bit that makes me slightly frightened that there are lots of referrals flying around the organisation that we don't know where they are at any particular time. Um, there was inefficiency and inequality created by the different wait times. There were people who were on choosing book pathways who'd been booked from GP surgery we got an appointment and then there was bits of paper that arrived on a consultant's desk that sat there for some considerable period of time before they triaged and then appointed and booked and we had different wait times and some of the variation was from about seven weeks up to about 20 odd weeks so they had lots and lots of variation. Um, patients didn't get the right appointment the first time. The reason we started this was we were reported by the CSU, so what some of the CSUs reported to us, that some patients were coming and then they were going, oh it's the wrong pathway we need to send you for a test, or we need to send you somewhere else, or you're in the wrong specialty. And not only is that disappointing for a patient, it's wasted their time, and it's wasted our time. So there was a lot of inefficiency around that. And then there was the risk of moving the paper referrals. And just to give you a flavour of what we were looking at, this is a DOS. Does anybody know what a DOS is? No? Directory. There we go, Helen, thank you very much. Excellent <laughs> The directory of service is what we publish on the national e-referral system, on the Choose and Book system, and this is what the GPs choose. And I think in our heads we think that a GP sits with a patient and then they choose the right appointment for them. That's not what happens. The GP dictates something, decides to refer to patients, sends them out to the desk, and then the clerk or receptionist on the desk tries to work out with the patient which is the best stop for them. And, you know, how do you choose? This is a smallish one, isn't it? There are bigger ones than this and this is the one we could get on the slide. So there's a lot of opportunity to actually just pick something 
and then the patient doesn't end up in the right place. So part of this project is about making this better. And that part will have a Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Rob Child. Um, I'm a program manager in informatics. So, so that was the problem. So we came up with a concept of receiving and triaging a referral electronically. So end-to-end -end stuff. Um, we wanted to uh, choose a book already existed. Yeah, it's already existed, but we wanted to optimise the electronic process, uh, electronic referral process, because we wanted it to be paperless. We wanted to reduce risk. You know, we wanted it to be traceable, auditable, etc. And effectively, we wanted one process and one queue, because, like Andrew described, we had paper, we had electronic referrals, nobody was being treated in the right order, etc. And then we wanted to obviously eliminate the waste by getting the patient into the right clinic the first time, so reducing the waste. So, where we were, or where we still are in many services, is that the physical movement of the referral goes round and round and round the system, which is, creates a lot, of, a lot of movement, a lot of waste, a lot of risk. So we took it from that to this. So referral comes in, received electronically, auto-registered, not quite there with that yet, but it's coming. Then we electronically triage, and then the outcomes can be advice and guidance. You do need a face-to-face, -face, or actually we might reject that referral because it's not quite right, or we need some more information from the GP, etc. So we ran a pilot in three areas, which was gastroenterology, colorectal, and upper GI. We used the ERS um, national system is our front door, and, uh, and then we uh, configured the windage system that we have internally for our triage. So we reconfigured and standardized and stripped them back really to simplify it. Thus, we simplified the DOS information. So, technically, we call it there's one pot for the GP to put it in, comes into us, we put it in the right workflow, ends up with the right clinical team, they make uh, the right triage, and then it comes back to RBS for processing. So, I'm going to go to Matt now. So, hello, my name is Matt Story. I'm the service manager for gastroenterology, endoscopy, hepatology, and renal. Um, so, kind of the medical half of AMS. Um, obviously, we've had um, we've had an ADOC talk to us, we've had a program manager to talk to us, um, and now it's time for a worker. Um, <laughs> I am, of course, joking. It's <laughs> time to do my work for me. Um, but this is, I, 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 of course, I'm massively in jest because I think. The point I wanted to start with is that we couldn't have delivered this in the speciality or even in the CSU. It's such a broad ranging piece that to have the time of the programme team in this, to have the driver of the board has hugely helped this. From, a, from an end user viewpoint, um, really, you know, I wouldn't say it's been painless in gastro, but it has been as easy as it could be and the, the relationships and the approach of the programme board it's been really helpful to this. I've never had to go back and fight for what we wanted in a speciality. I've just had to have the conversation with Rob and with Sally to say, this doesn't seem to be quite working, or could this do this? And we've been able to have those kind of sensible conversations around this. And the most important bit falling out of that is it's delivered more and better for our patients. And that is the bottom line of all of this. We're going to talk a bit about money in a little bit, but what this really means is that this is gastroenterology on the end. As you can see, huge number of patients have had different things done to them. It's difficult to pick up on this slide, but we'll talk about the numbers slightly more in a minute. Across all three of the specialities, over 80% of patients have a different outcome from triage versus their original referral. And that's a huge number of appointments saved. It's a huge number of patients who aren't having to make arrangements to get to hospital to take time off work to have someone look after their kids. And it means we can do more. So gastro is what I'm closest to, so I'll talk more around this end. You can see as a result of um, this and a number of other measures, our follow-up backlog has dropped right off. When I came into post, we were looking at three-month backlogs of um, in the region of 500 patients. And now we're reporting four. It's a really tangible, measurable output of this. Just recently, um, in kind of across February and March, our gastro referrals spiked from about 80 routine referrals received a week to about 250 referrals received, and that was sustained over two or three weeks. And we've sat that up. We've got more confidence in what's happening because we're triaging patients more appropriately. The urgent patients are getting seen at the front of the field on putting the right patient in the right appointment first time. 
So 44% of those people received through routine pathways were altered to a two-week wait or an urgent pathway. Massive clinical significance. Um, I was in, um, in endoscopy actually talking to uh, one of the doctors down there who was actually triaging at that time. And he said, you know, this is a really good example. This is a patient who's been referred by a GP for a routine appointment, actually looking back on his history, looking back on what I can tell as an IBD specialist, if we don't get this chap in within the next three weeks, he will have to have surgery for his bowel receptor. What do I put on the window preferral? Put, please put into any available appointment, two week or otherwise. And it happened. We've gone through that process to deliver more for our patients. We've reduced our average wait time. We've improved our patient experience. We've shortened the clinical pathway. So we do a lot of test first, a lot of patients coming in to, particularly across gastro, um, a lot of patients coming into endoscopy before having their first outpatient appointment, and that outpatient appointment is all they need. We've got the test, we, we've done your test, we've found this, or we've not found this, this is what we're gonna do for you. And this is the net benefit to the health economy. So, Significant numbers of people having pre-investigations, more obviously in gastro and colorectal than upper GI, but that's just variation between specialities. And actually, I have, I have little doubt that that number will begin to rise um, as they gain more confidence in the process. I should also highlight out that this gastro have been kind of informally triaging referrals for quite a long time. Um, it's one of the things because gastro's performance position was awful. It's one of the things that was put in before my time in post. I'm certainly not taking any credit for that. This has just formalised it and allowed us to audit it and monitor it in a way that's much more productive for the speciality, but also much safer for patients. Um, as you can see, significant numbers of people having their priority changed. Number of people being triaged to the right place first time. Huge thing with my team and my endoscopy um, system PSCs are here today. They get bored of hearing me say, let's just do it right the first time, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, because that's the best thing for our patients, it's not about saving time, it's not about efficiency, it's about getting that patient to the right place the first time. Um, significant numbers of people being upgraded to cancer pathways, all in all, and this is a fairly conservative estimate, we think we've saved something like 2,301 appointments. So that's patients who have had, not had unnecessary follow-ups, it's patients who've not come in to be told, yeah, you, just, you need to have an endoscopy or a fecal calcitation before you can do anything else. Because it's already been done by the time they come to clinic. Now cash falls out of the bottom of that. Well, thinking back to those numbers I talked about from a service viewpoint, purely from that kind of patient experience perspective, it means that we've absorbed about a 70 to 80% rise in demand into that speciality without compromising our waiting times. In fact, we've shrunk our PTL, we've shrunk the total number of patients on our waiting list, because we've got the right patients to the right point first time round. That's better for the individual, and it's like a glorious bit for a service manager. You know, I often find myself trapped in the middle between managing the individual patient and managing the population. And this is that fantastic congruence where we do the right thing for the patient, and actually it makes it so much easier to manage the whole population because we have more capacity we have more opportunity to do the right thing for our patients. If you are interested in cash, we're talking around the half a million region across three, these three specialities alone. And obviously gastro and colorectal, fairly big specialities, um, but rolling that out across the trust, it becomes clear the amount of time, effort, and money we can save by getting this rolled out. So what we learnt, um, it needs to go out trust-wide, I hope you'd agree with the case we've made that it should be a trust-wide implementation. It supports the financial sustainability. Um, we're in discussions with the CCG, I'm using the royal word there, that's Angie's particular law. Angie is in discussion <laughs> with the CCGs around getting this funded because one of the things we found from a, um, from a speciality level, and as, as this rolls out across the trust, one thing to be prepared for is that even if you are triaging referrals, certainly the way that was done in gastro is in a fairly nebulous and formal way. So a pile of paper arrived with the secretaries, those were distributed to whatever consultants happened to be passing. To put that through a single stream and have it that the individual must triage that within 72 hours is, is really brought into focus for the gastro team, certainly, that workload falling to one person. 
and how difficult that is to manage alongside other duties. So we've had to allocate time to it in a way that we didn't have to do more informally. It's the right thing to do, we're happy to do it, it gets it done right and it gets it done right first time, but it does need some funding behind it to support the time that we're releasing to triage. And the CCD have agreed to fund it, we just try to sort out how. And the other bit at the bottom, again, you know, making the case very strongly that this is the right thing to do for our patients. If we can manage patients remotely without having to come in, and that's the right thing for the individual, absolutely brilliant. You know, I'm sure along with everyone in this room, I work full time, I've got kids. If I don't have to take time off work, if I don't have to sort out childcare, I don't really want to. If someone can ring me up through a virtual clinic and we can do it over the phone, if someone can send me a letter saying, you know, You've been referred to us, Mr. Story, having reviewed the case. We think you should try this and please recontact your GP if there's any further problems. That's a much better experience for me. It means I can still come to work, it means I'm not sorting out my childcare, let alone what it means for us as a trust, as a patient. And I hope you can see the drivers. And that's our roadmap, we hope. Uh, we, uh, I just want you to understand we're not going to try and work on it. You refer to triage everywhere because it doesn't suit everywhere. There will still be some things that will be directly booked on the choosing book system, the TV rate stuff, where it's bond or obvious who needs to come in on what pathway. But across those specialties, we've got a number of, across those CSUs, we've got a number of specialties whereby it is confusing uh, with our doctors and it is confusing for the GPs about where they send the patients and what they need to do. So this is our proposal, and we're already working with women's and cardiac respiratory yeah. and the rest of the AMS to actually get that sorted as our phase one proposal and then we'll, we'll work our way through the rest. So the question's back to you, what the proposal's back to you is if you think this would help in some area that we've not gone on there, let us know. Brilliant, thank you very much. Really interesting and clearly lots of waste. It looked like money saved for the CCGs, um, and hopefully that means, that, as you said, they'll be reinvested. But I'm sure we'll have some questions for you um, at the end. So um, it's now time for our RPIW team to report out. Um, this is Value Stream 3. Dean is the um, executive sponsor for the Value Stream. And this is critical care step downs to neurosciences. And the team have been working on preparing the EDA. So, Chris, Jimmy, and your colleagues, please move forward. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, my name is Chris. I'm a KPO specialist and workshop lead for this RPIW. Thank you for coming here today to see it. Uh, this is our first RPIW on the LGI site. Uh, we've been looking at the value streams critical care step down to the RR sciences, and this RPIW is about preparing the EDA. Um, for those particular patients on L24 and L25, those neural scientist patients on L24 and L25, to increase the improve the flow through the organisation. The project form here highlights some of the challenges we've been looking at this week, such as the burden of work for the junior doctors um, who have to create accurate and concise discharge letters for our patients um, about their journey through our organisation, often having spent very little time with the patient themselves and having very little insight into that journey. Uh, we also needed to ensure that our EDANs were accurate, ready for the patient when the patient's ready to be discharged. Uh, and that they pass on clear, concise, and relevant information to enable the best possible care and follow up for our patients. So I'm going to let the team tell you all about the work we've been doing. So approaching the week, we set some targets which are captured on the target progress report. The initial lead time from decision to discharge on the ward round to when the EDAM was ready, I was just short of seven hours. Our target was to get that delivered in under two. Um, Quality, we looked at measuring how many EDAMs were prepared ahead of time, so not just on the day of discharge. And in our sample, preparing for the week, 100% were only done on the day of discharge. That's a defect rate of, of 100%. Uh, the interruptions to doctors was another quality measure we wanted to capture. It won't surprise many people in the room to know that 100% of the time they were interrupted from their work preparing the EDAM. We looked at a 5S measure. You've heard a little bit about the benefits of 5S earlier. Our measure was about the pre-packed medication cupboard. 
can we get that um, more effective to be used? And finally, a setup reduction measure. So this is the actual time it takes the clinician, on average, to complete the EDAM on day of discharge, standing at 28 minutes, with our target to get that under nine minutes. Our tack time reflects the uh, calculation of the pace of the work to meet demand, uh, and it comes out 120 minutes. Hi, I'm Chris Mould, one of the neurosurgery trainees here in Leeds. For the vast majority of our patients, the EDAM is started late in the day and may take a significant chunk of time to complete. It often requires additional information that may not be easily available at the time. As a result, there is an ingrained culture within doctors' minds that EDAM should not be a priority of clinical tasks, such as booking scans, prescribing medications, and reviewing poorly patients. In order to reduce the burden of work involved in preparing the EDAM, and to allow it to be completed sooner, we've initiated three measures to aid pre-population of the clinical information. The EDAM begins with our elective patients arriving on L28 on the morning of their surgery. The reason for their admission, along with any pertinent clinical information, will be pre-populated on the EDAM prior to discharge. For example, are there any medications stopped pre-operatively, which will require review on the discharge, or any specific follow-up requests that may aid the final discharging doctor. If a patient spends time within our critical care department, a summary of this event will be pre-populated within the EDAN prior to the patient leaving HDU. For example, what operations or acute events took place? Were any new medications started? Is a DNAR order in place or has palliative input begun? This intervention aims to save the discharging doctor considerable time summarising these key events. Finally, our clinical nurse specialists within neurosurgery provide key input throughout our patient's journey, often following them from ITU to the moment of discharge, and often hold key vital information about what is required in that follow-up. Our CNS nurses now have access to the EDAM and can pre-populate clinical information, discharge medication requests, and specific follow-up requirements at any point prior to discharge. This will save valuable time and improve the accuracy of information transfer on the day of discharge, and has also prevented double booking with follow-up appointments. Hello, my name is Karen Burrs, and I'm the band 7 on L25 male neurosurgical board and I'm a process owner. The team also highlighted the need for more discussion around medication at the actual decision to discharge. We have produced this form for the nurses in charge of the board. It acts as a prompt to enable the nurse leading the board round to clarify vital missing information through discussion with the patient and the senior medical team about medical needs before the EDAN is completed. This then ensures that all information is readily available early in the day, for instance, restart dates for anticoagulants, etc. With this, will then prevent the senior medical team being interrupted whilst in theatre or clinics. This form has been in use over the last three days on both neurosurgical wards and appears to be working well, and we're going to audit this over the next few weeks. We have also included a work standard for aid in the completion of the checklist, and this is available on the back of the form. Hello, my name is Jazz, and I'm a part-time nurse on health and neurosurgery. Following the audits and observations recorded in recent studies, it was clear that when data was recorded, that a considerable amount of waste and motion was lost. The majority of time was left for spent gathering and recorded information, which is vital to pay for safe discharges. As a nurse in charge, you're often allowed to questions patients clear the discharge, have they been cleared by the therapist, do they require transport, and is the EDAM on the ward? The whiteboard was introduced, it's a simple device which proved to be an excellent communication tool. It was introduced to this te team with positive feedback. The whiteboard identifies patients who have been identified as medically fit during morning ward round. Um, it's straightforward to follow through the first column of patients being identified, whether there's any further input required from the therapist or from the OTs, um, what stage the EDAM is actually can follow that closely and there's any other concerns that may arise. Um, the Whiteboard Act, as a visual recap to all staff involved, it is currently up and running um, and should have been meeting our targets in less than two hours. Um, saving time and discharges are vital as they have a direct impact on patient flow. By meeting our target, we will be able to accommodate patients stepping down from critical care and be guaranteed beds for patients waiting for elective surgery. Hi, my name is Andrew White. I'm with the Advanced uh, Nurse Practitioners within Neurosurgery. One of the other aspects that we looked at was the ease of access to information when completing the EDAM, specifically medication charts. These um, can typically be found at either the nursing station where there are pending changes, in the IV clinical room where the nurse is preparing some IV medication, 
on the portable workstation or alternatively the patient folder at the bedside. Um, it's only a small aspect, but quite a lot of time is spent by staff looking around for charts when they are needed. Um, so we thought that was a waste of time from um, all members of the team. There was a heated discussion about how to move this forward until someone pointed out uh, the patient's perspective um, and the charge should be kept by the patient's bedside whenever possible. Uh, any medication issues such as requests, changes to medicines, transcriptions were to be added to a to-do list which is kept at the nursing station but leaving the group chart at the patient's bedside. The nurses went completing IV medication preparation for asked to take just one chart to the clinical room at a time so that lots of charts weren't missing from the bedside all at once. Evaluation is so evaluation of this over the few, um, subsequent few days showed very compliance um, but that just highlights that cultural change, even small ones, is really difficult when you're addressing a multidisciplinary team um, and it may take a longer period for that actually to take hold. My name is Liz Drian, I'm a pharmacist for neurosurgery. We also looked at the supply of regular medicines on discharge for the patient and we started by reviewing <coughs> the letter inviting the patients in for surgery, which already asked them to bring their own medicines into hospital with them, but now also tells them that they'll only be receiving new or changed medication on discharge in order to give them realistic, realistic expectations about what they're likely to receive when they go into the hospital. Um, we had some positive feedback on this letter from the patients who reviewed it and from staff about the new format as well. In addition to that, we looked at the bypass pharmacy function on Blue Sphere, um, which allows nursing staff to supply medicines from the pre packed medication cupboard, uh, such as simple pain relief and analgesic medication. This is an example of the pre packed cupboard. Um, the system was already in place and available, but was used inconsistently. And so we briefed the doctors on the wards and added it to the training package for induction of new doctors. Um, looking at the cupboards specifically using the 5S approach, um, we adjusted and reviewed them in order to streamline and sort what was in there, make it more efficient and easy to use. Um, and also using the robot, which is available on one of the wards. We also aim to standardise the process across the two wards because they were running different systems for the same uh, task. The overall aim for this piece of work, so that's the five best approach for the, uh, for the cupboard as well. The overall um, aim for the work we did here was to reduce the supply of regular medicines on discharge, therefore with associated time and cost savings, but importantly, to minimise the patient's weight for the medication. Hello, um, I'm Kirsten Leach, I'm the band seven on L24, which is female neurosurgery, and I'm a process owner. Uh, this is our newspaper. These are the actions that we have commenced work on during this week. We expect to complete and fully achieve the actions by day 30, and therefore this newspaper will continue to evolve over the next few weeks. We have committed to meet as a group on a weekly basis to achieve this. We have chosen some metrics to audit whether the team are using the new tools in an effective way to improve the population of the EGANs. The changes that we have made have already reduced the time taken to complete an EGAN enabling quicker discharge from the ward. The benefit of this is timely bed um, availability for critical care step-downs, earlier theatre starts, and fewer delays or cancellations. So imagine your relative sat waiting for neurosurgery. They are worried, they are anxious and scared about the operation, but they've tried, they've tried their hardest to prepare for them, this, themselves for this, this day. We need to be there to offer reassurance and support yet we can't even tell them if there's definitely a bed available for their surgery this day. The impact of cancellation for patients can be devastating, and we truly believe that our project goes some way towards improving the patient experience. So we return to our target progress report, which reflects lead time, now an average of 125 minutes, falling just short of our 125 minute target, but a 69% improvement with the time we've had available uh, I hope you agree is, is very impressive. Quality has been challenging for us. So the EDAN started ahead of the day of discharge. We got two out of seven, a 29% improvement. But because of the flow of patients through the, uh, through the system, even ones that have been started today aren't captured in our measures. So we're looking forward to reporting significant improvements uh, in 30 days time. Um, you've heard about the challenge of even small changes on culture. 
Our quality measure in terms of interruptions reflects that. There's no shift in the 100% defect, but um, I'm sure you, the team are committed to working on that with the ideas both in place and hopefully with the momentum we gain from this week about other ideas that our colleagues might share of how we could get that to look better in 30 days. Uh, superb effort by predominantly the pharmacy team. Sarah O'Neill, who's a pharmacy technician who can't report out with us today, has, has relatively single-handedly moved this from a level one to a level three. Um, finally, setup reduction, another ambitious target at nine minutes, but we've taken 10 minutes out of the 28 we started with, and so an average of four readans a day gives the doctor 40 minutes of time per ward to do something valuable for our patients. Uh, so our lessons learned, uh, the main one probably is you can't see the truth for the trees sometimes. So taking a step back from our work allows us to see the waste and put improvements into place. Um, being out on the Gemba, I think we've learned that this week, um, engaging with the home team colleagues has allowed us to spread great ideas right from the start and they've engaged with those ideas in one of them as well, which has been great for us. Uh, improvement is difficult, it's not easy, um, and we need to be consistent and persistent with that communication of that improvement work. Um, often the information we need um, is held by different people, unfortunately, in their heads. Um, so we need this information to be available all the time, ensuring that it's passed on when required and effectively by the most appropriate person to pass that information on. Um, and it's there for when it's needed, which is the time of discharge. Thank yous. Uh, far too many to go through individually. Sarah O'Neill, we've mentioned already, who can't be here with us today, she's our annual lead. Um, some of Rachel, give us away, ladies, uh, who have been with us this week um, and input into us and people in this work with us who couldn't do without them. Um, and then the whole home team, so every, all the staff on L24 and L25, uh, the specialist nurses at the back, give us away, who absolutely engaged with this, jumped on board with us and were 100% supportive of this work, so thank you very much. Uh, the clinicians, a couple at the back there, give us away, guys, thank you very much. Um, again, who have supported us with this work, who have covered Chris to allow him to be here with us this week, um, and absolutely the, the box in this piece of work. Uh, pharmacy, I've got some of the pharmacy team here. Thank you very much, Joel, there. thank you very much um, for the help with the 5S and just with some guidance and rules and regulations that we need to clarify on. Thank you very much. Without these guys, we wouldn't have been able to do the work we've done this week. Uh, the management team, both CSUs, again, thank you very much uh, for your support. Prior to this RPIW, uh, helping us over a couple of pickups we had getting here. Uh, during the RPIW, they've been visible every day for us. Thank you very much for that. But most importantly, now, after the RPIW, I think this is where the hard work starts. And these guys absolutely need the support. Last but not least, these guys here. Um, absolutely phenomenal team. Uh, jumped right in from day one. Uh, maybe a little bit skeptical on the day, um, but absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully, fully engaged now and ready to take this work forward. So, again, it's been great working with you guys. Thank you very much. That's about it for us. It's again International Nurses Day, so please do stay behind and have a forward taking for your nurse. Thank you very much. So, fantastic. Well done. Um, uh, that you've done a really great job this week, guys. And I just ask you to stay there a moment because I'm just going to ask um, if Steve or Sarah or Ellie would like to say a word and also Dean as the exec sponsor. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I certainly. Sarah, is that comfortable? Oh, thank you very much. Um, hello, for those that know me, my name's Sarah and I'm the head of nursing for neurosciences. I need to apologise, I haven't got my hello, my name badges on today, and I feel naked. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm not the best here. Um, so, guys, from the moment that we sat in the room to do introductions on Monday, I just absolutely knew that we had the right people in the room with that can do attitude and drive. And I think the KPO team would agree that actually you've been so driven to want to make differences and improve processes and patient outcomes absolutely from the outset. I think it's been a great example of the fact that we've had two CSUs working collaboratively. A great example of the Leeds Way in action, 
and actually how you've engaged with the uh, matron from quick care and obviously and uh, Simon as well in relation to the um, changes that you've made around stepping down from HDU and the EDAM process starting there. Um, so you have, and you've absolutely thought outside of the box to make some differences for our patients. I think for me, as we've already alluded to, this is just the start of the journey and it's from all of the techniques and information that you've had bombarded at you this week, it's how we then disseminate that across the CSU um, to bring about the process change which you're already demonstrating, but also the cultural change within the CSU, and for me that's just as important. So, hats on, well done. So, yeah, um, again, for those who don't know, we have Steve Wilson, who can quite often yourself, so again, I'd just like to thank the team for putting in all the hours and hard work, but equally, going back to what Guy said, I'd like to thank the home team, I know that we did have a lot of anxiety about Chris not being available on the ward. Um, I know that the junior doctors upstairs have stepped in to cover him and allow him to do that. Um, and I'm grateful to Chris who sent out a fantastic summary um, to, the, to, to his team midweek to explain that this wasn't just uh, a DOS for him. Uh, <laughs> it genuinely was putting in some hours um, to support this work, which I think has been fantastic. And again, for me, I've kind of in my own head had an idea of where the problems sat within EDAM preparation. Um, and I think what the really remarkable thing for me was just being able to identify through the process precisely how much time we waste, or that these guys waste, and the nursing staff waste, and the pharmacists waste, trying to get this process prepared and done in a, in a timely fashion. Um, so being able to bring that down from 401 minutes down to 125 minutes is an absolutely phenomenal achievement in three days um, and just really emphasises how much we could be doing better um, and will be able to do better in 30 days' time. So, absolutely outstanding piece of work. Thank you very much. And, uh, hello, my name is uh, Dean, I'm Director of HR and all of these uh, value students have an executive uh, sponsor that I happen to um, in this one, and uh, when I was talking to Kirsten earlier, uh, the thing that they've been most anxious about all week is actually doing this piece. <laughs> <laughs> standing up in, uh, in front of everyone, and uh, Yvette had said when she did hers, uh, that it felt like a, a mother at an nativity play when you see your sort of <coughs> uh, Yeah, I have to say, for, for this week, this is the, the first one that we've done on this site, as uh, Chris was saying earlier, and it's also the first one that, that involves two, first value student that involves two uh, CS uh, use and so lots of us have been around irritating your week, popping in at lunchtime and things. So uh, I, I guess we've been like the expectant fathers before the birth. <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered that we've got twins. <laughs> so, um, but I know that a lot of the work has gone here in terms of uh, on uh, 25 and 26, but the impact that's going to have in terms of critical care, more quickly able to get their patients to you, uh, it's going to be phenomenal as well. So that work continues as we do the work on the value stream. I'm sure that both those CS use will see the value stream. <laughs> So thank you. Thanks, Dean. And, and I know that Andy and Simon from Critical Care are here as well. And I'm, I'm not ask, necessarily asking you to say anything, but if you would like to, then please do. Absolutely. Um, we have been, uh, we, we, we stand to benefit uh, our uh, throughput and our patients uh, from all the work that's going on here. This week's project has all sat with neurosurgery, uh, with neurosciences, and we felt maybe a little bit left out, so we knew, we knew it was going to be that way, we knew that we couldn't have a direct hand in it, but in fact, I've seen today that we can, we've identified a point within the passage through critical care that we can be involved in EDAM preparation as well, um, and that's, that's a, a, a great thing to, to come out of it, and it's just reminded us all that it is a collaborative project between uh, critical care and neurosciences. Um, we'll have some very busy weeks in the future after IWs, but uh, this week, congratulations go to neurosciences. Well done. Thank you. Julian, I don't know whether you would like to say anything, because um, I, I don't know how good the reception is, but is there anything you would like to say? Um, if you can hear me, Yvette, just to congratulate everyone that reported out today. I've listened to it all avidly and seen what I have been able to see is just a terrific example of the progress that we're making with improvement across the trust. The first RPIW is always a challenge. I had the fortune to see the team in action yesterday, and I have to say, I think they've done 
uh, a brilliant job. Keep it going. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, can I invite Will and Rob and Matt um, and Angie just to come down to the front because, um, you know, I would like to give an opportunity for you to ask questions to uh, to any of them. And, and if you haven't got any questions, if you've got anything you want to do in terms of offering support or help to keep their projects going, then, uh, then please do. So, have we got any, any questions? Steve? <coughs> I thought, Will, your presentation was absolutely brilliant and, and I think it's a really, really important piece of work. Um, we've done a similar, one of my consultant colleagues in anaesthetic did a similar process in anaesthetic rooms, looking at the time it takes an anaesthetist to go into an anaesthetic room and find the equipment required for an emergency situation and then standardising it and repeating the process. It's similar to a piece of work um, and there is some um, evidence out there National literature around benefits of fly vesting and improving standardisation. Um, and without doubt, it's feasible. And I think the key thing you put out there is what do you do in an emergency when you're taken to a ward where you don't know where anything is, you need something in a hurry, and everyone else is busy. And I think that will be something that will genuinely improve patient outcomes across the whole trust to other. Thanks, Stephen. I, I think it is a really important piece of work, and, and actually, I absolute hats off to Will because he has he started this project on his own um, and, and and he's still largely done an awful lot <laughs> on his own Definitely. so yeah. if, um, if L2425 wants to volunteer um, to, to to take on some of the mantle as well and work with him or anybody else We actually highlighted it, exactly this problem during the week yes. um, and a similar scenario would be for instance doing a lumbar puncture so it, you need about punctures. 15 items <laughs> to do a lumbar puncture. But it's, it's, it's underneath everything I hear, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's huge. Yeah, I won't, it's I won't, I won't begin on lumbar punctures, <laughs> but I, I could go for a good half an hour. There's a huge, huge problem because, I don't know if it's on there, so did the acute floor stock all of their water dependent yeah, wherever they're you are, independent budgets, different. but yes. none of them do enough to actually... It takes me longer to find well, the equipment than to, to do the procedures. So we've clearly found a common... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I, I for one will certainly be, if we can um, get more resource into our KPO team eventually, maybe this is something we could have um, a full on idea what you want, um, what we do. So, brilliant, thanks. Um, any other questions? Joe? This, this is so generic as a question, it could be anyone who wants to answer it. Have you already spotted where the, the, the forces are that we 